It's great to be with you all. I'd like to extend my thanks to, to uh, the Grand Master and Karen and Ingrid and Bob uh, for all their work and assistance uh, on these Department of Instruction teleconferences. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be learning with you as always. And as often our practice, we're going to have uh, a meditation first. And to do that, I'm going to bring up uh, an image uh, to assist us in that. So just bear with me for a moment. Great. This is from the uh, Rosicrucian Digest uh, cover from January 1984. And it's an artwork by Leopold de Postels, uh, another inspired Rosicrucian artist. And it's entitled Aspiration. And we can uh, zoom in on it even further here. And we'll use this as part of our inspiration for our meditation today. You know, Leopold de Postels did a series of uh, paintings on the mystical life and mystical experiences. I know many of you are familiar with this painting and also his work on the heart unafraid that uh, uh, Frater Michael Schuller uh, used as an image as part of his presentation dealing with courage. This painting here is a very inspiring one because we see the figure down below re reaching up or, uh, towards the figure here. This is part and parcel of the same being. In some ways, this is you view this as our master within or the, the divine, the divine within, as we're coming into deeper and deeper understanding of ourselves as human beings, we move closer and closer to God. And while that happens, God moves closer and closer to us in a, in a unified consciousness or in unity. So bear this inspiring image in mind because it'll assist us as we uh, ascend to the heights of celestial sanctum and have increased awareness of the, the master within and the ascended masters. I think you'll find too the beautiful blues in this are very calming and soothing. And you see from the light of the central figure, there's a yellow light, but then it radiates out into these beautiful shades of blue with a very profound and uplifting effect. So when you're ready, we'll begin our meditation and I invite you to uh, close your eyes. Um, we have a lot of uh, stimulation often through the eyes, particularly in modern society with all sorts of devices. Just let the eyes take it a little easier and we'll let uh, the mind and the brain function and focus on different things in visual stimuli uh, mainly. I invite you to take a few deep breaths. It can be neutral, that is neither holding the inhalation or holding the exhalation. And if it's comfortable for you, you may wish to breathe entirely through your nostrils because that's one way to ensure that we have that deep breath and that beautiful relaxation response through the vagus nerve in our body. The temple of the body is wondrously set up for relaxation and assisting the master within that it houses for attunement with the cosmic. And this is one of the ways that it's done. The rhythmic breath also attunes us with the vibrations of the universe through the cosmic keyboard. These are all applying laws and principles of the Rosicrucians. Rosicrucian teachings are very practical and when we apply them, we come into a deeper understanding and practice, not only in theory. Just enjoy the rhythm of the breath. It's all part of the work and worship of our order this hour. No matter what's going on in your life now, view this time as a mini retreat to be strengthened, to be rejuvenated and stronger, to discharge any duty or face whatever you need to. As you're taking the deep invigorating breaths you may feel a very enriching tingling in your body. Not the tingling that is described colloquially as pins and needles where there's, when there's a lack of oxygen, but just the opposite, when there's more oxygen and when there's an increase of the cosmic essence or, or the vital life force as the Rosicrucians refer to it in the body. You see, meditation helps us tune in with lots of different levels of energy. We always have these great resources of energy in us just a matter of being receptive to them. Just in like Frater Leopold de Postel's painting, the aspirant seeing this 
inner self radiating with tremendous energy that's always there with us. It's just a matter of realizing it. The painting is much akin to the experience of the master Yeheshua, said to be on Mount Tabor with three specially selected disciples when he experienced the transfiguration. We too are called to this transfiguration and the central method by which it is done is by regular meditation. And each time we meditate to a degree, we experience this transfiguration. To express it in alchemical terms, the transmutation of our entire being. So just keep taking the deep breaths, enjoying the life force and the tingling. And as a spiritual aspirant, not only enjoying the physical relaxation or, or the relaxation response, but also experience it on a deeper spiritual level as we attune with the cosmic. May the divine essence of the cosmic infuse my being and cleanse me of all impurities of mind and body, that I may enter the celestial sanctum and attune in pureness and worthiness. So be it in truth, so mote it be. Now continue with your eyes closed. Picture yourself rising up above the room where you're seated, up over the house where you are, even up over the local geographic area, such as a city or town. Just rise up faster and faster and feel the exhilaration of the ascent. And then rise up over the province or state where you are. And even the entire country. And keep rising faster and faster. Do this with your inner nature so it can be done calmly and strongly. And see the continent where you live and even the, the hemisphere where you live and ultimately the beautiful blue jewel of the earth. Sense the earth rotating around its axis. And then keep rising up higher and higher again Seeing the solar system. See the various planets, such as Mars, its reddish form, and the great rings around Saturn, the large planet of Jupiter, and the great fiery ball of the sun, which the planets are revolving about. Continue to look further and further past the solar system and start to sense other stars in the Milky Way galaxy, our great home. And just enjoy the exhilaration of the ascent. And as you go up, take in the wonder of the various stellar phenomena like pulsars and quasars and binary stars and even supernovae. Even Go past black holes and dark matter. And start to sense the great rotating motion of the Milky Way galaxy. Our home in it is by one of the great spiraling arms. And go out beyond that spiraling arm. And take a look back at the great spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy and sense its great motion about its center. But then continue on again and see other galaxies, some of them in great spiraling forms, but also see nebulae and clusters of galaxies. Take, start to take in the stupendous harmony and order of the entire universe. Travel faster and faster inwardly use great inner strength. Don't be passive as 
later will be passive when we reach the celestial sanctum. At this point, use great inner spiritual force. Take in the beautiful colors of the universe, a harmony of the spheres, the dynamic actions through the laws and principles of the cosmic. Continue to rise faster and faster. And as you do that, you have a more and more expansive view of the universe. It's akin to having a more and more expansive understanding of the cosmic consciousness, of the consciousness of the entirety of the cosmos and the cosmic mind. Ultimately, I think you'll sense a great revolving action of the universe itself about the cosmic axis that has been spoken of since ancient times. Sense the great revolving motion of the cosmos. At the same time, increase your attunement with the cosmic mind. Sense all, sense all sentient beings in the universe. And as we come closer and closer to that great cosmic axis, home in on the center or the midpoint of that cosmic axis. And as you come to it, slow up and see there your celestial sanctum, which you may wish to picture as a place particularly sacred to you. It may be an inspiring temple or maybe an inspiring place in nature or some other place of special sacred significance to you. And when you reach it, come into it with a prayer of gratitude on your lips. For this opportunity to fulfill our birthright and cosmic attunement. And take your seat inside and fill it in with the sights and sounds of the senses. Make it real. There may be beautiful stained glass windows or an uplifting scent of incense inspiring symbols, various parts of the structure, and others of like mind, Rosicrucians and other seekers gathered there as well. You may see the Grand Master and the Imperator of our Order conducting a special convocation there. Take in all the sights and sounds. And, it's, and when it's become quite real to you, just sit there and dwell in peace profound. Deeply enjoy the silence. If you find the mind wandering any time, just lovely, lovingly and gently bring it back to the breath, the concentration on being in the celestial sanctum, at the center of your being, at the center of the cosmos. at the heart of the practice of meditation is the purity of heart and dwelling in the stillness, never deepening in dynamic stillness.
while you're dwelling at the center of your being, the center of your heart, which is one with the center of the cosmos. You may wish to picture your mind expanding out from the center to encompass the entirety of the cosmos. And in this way, become the cosmic mind. Assume the cosmic mind. And then continue to dwell in profound peace. Now, friars and sorrows and participants will continue this meditation, but as a further spiritual operation of the work and worship of the Rosicrucian Order Anmark, let us conduct a period for metaphysical aid. That involves sending love and well being and healing vibrations to all those who've requested it from the Rosicrucian Order Anmark. We'll do this as an act of the silent council in conjunction with the Council of Solace. For all those who petitioned for aid from the Rosicrucian Order, the Grand Lodge, but also possibly from the affiliate body where you are a student and member. And all the frontline workers on earth and all sentient beings throughout the cosmos that are in need at this time. Where you dwell in the cosmic mind, radiate love and well-being from the heart and this mind to all those in need at this time. Feel the love flow out from you, just like water flowing out from a fire hydrant or light shining forth from a supernova. Just radiate it out to all throughout the cosmos. Feel the exhilaration of this act of service it will heighten our cosmic attunement for as we give, so shall we receive. As you radiate this aid, I think you'll find that the cosmic essence, the vital life force is increasingly and strong in the temple of your body. Just note that, but continue to concentrate on the breath and being one with the cosmic mind. And at a certain point, I think you'll find as you radiate the love and well-being, it'll continue to happen without your conscious effort. Once that happens, just continue to dwell in the stillness. assured that the aid will continue now and always. Now we'll conclude this period of the work of the silent council in conjunction with the council of souls of radiating love and well-being as metaphysical aid. But we'll continue to dwell in peace profound at the heights of the celestial sanctum some time more. 
But to conclude this period of metaphysical aid, let us say together, if it pleases the cosmic, it is done. So be it in truth, so mote it be. Now let us continue to dwell in the stillness and in cosmic attunement. Now, for adders and sorrows and participants, you may wish to issue a prayer of gratitude for this opportunity to be of service and the privilege that is our birthright to tune with the celestial sanctum and the cosmic. May we continue to fill our mission in life. And when you're ready, and you step out from the celestial sanctum and begin our descent back through the cosmos, past the myriads of super clusters of galaxies and galaxies and nebulae, and all the wondrous stellar phenomena of the supernovae and the pulsars and the quasars. The red giants and the white dwarfs black holes. So we see in the distance the great spiraling galaxy of the Milky Way, our special home. And as we get close to that great spiraling arm, which is our home, come back into it and pass by myriad stars. We can ultimately see the great system and order of our solar system and the beautiful fiery ball of the sun. and see the beautiful blue jewel of our earth, the oceans and the great spiraling weather systems and come back to our hemisphere and continent and our country and our, and our province or state. And then back to the city or geographic area that we were, we can say together, May the God of my heart sanctify this attunement of self with the celestial sanctum. So be it in truth, so mote it be. And when you're ready, come back into where you're dwelling, your house, and the room where you left off, in the seat. And you may wish to have a little stretch for a moment. And when you're open, when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Okay, we're going to present now on meditation in depth three, as mentioned earlier. And we'll keep in mind that meditation is the key and central practice of spirituality and for the mastery of life. Indeed, much progress can be made when meditation is practiced daily. You know, it's kind of helpful to note often the etymology of words. And an important part of that for meditation is the first three letters, med, M-E-D. And it's a proto-Indo-European root meaning, which can mean to take appropriate measures. And we find it in other related words, such as medicine, because meditation is very important for our health. Now I'm going to go over a series of questions related to what we've been talking about and meditating about. The first one is, if meditation is so great, why isn't everybody doing it? 
And that's that's a great question. You know, in Rosicrucian Order, we learn about how uh, each person has their own reality. And underlying that is an actuality. It's given by the cosmic B keyboard, by the actual rates of vibration of all phenomena in this in the space-time continuum or in space and time. And over time, as we mature and evolve, we can test our reality by our conscience or the still small voice within. And through the experience of harmonium, which is a very beautiful word that the Rosicrucians have for an experience that we can have on all levels of our being. Harmonium of the harmonious relationships of our vital organs and the various uh, physical systems in our body, which constitutes uh, health but also there's the health or wholeness and harmonium in our harmonious relationships with our relationships with others, but also our harmonious relationships with our environment and indeed the temple of the cos cosmos itself. And ultimately that uh, harmonium that comes about through ecstasy that is our birthright of the, of, uh, the divine sense of harmonium. Through our Rosicrucian teachings, we work with all these. And as we evolve our reality, We'll experience these things more and more, all of these different levels of harmonium, which is one unity. So the reality that we experience is not an arbitrary thing. It, uh, we're working to result, re evolve it. Just like with our soul, per and a similar way to express this is our soul personality evolves. It's like a polishing of a mirror within us. That then more and more we can reflect uh, the one soul. Now, with meditation, often it takes a while for people to realize what is it and why should I do it? That's often an important part of, uh, there has to be a consciousness raising, there has to be an increase in knowledge. I can, I can mention, for example, about 36 years ago, when a member of the Rosicrucian Order, a student of the Rosicrucian Order, sometimes he liked to uh, go out into a, a, a deeper woods, a ravine area behind where he lived to meditate. And uh, uh, it's good to meditate in one's home and one's sanctum, but one, one has opportunities to meditate out in nature. The sounds of nature are often very uplifting. And he would go to a place where there was a, a small stream. Sometimes you see a muskrat go by and hear various birds and the sounds of the wind going through the pines was very so soothing and it was part of the music of nature or the tune with the cosmic. But people go deep into the woods for a variety of different reasons. Each person has their own reality. And on one occasion while he was meditating there, and he was, uh, he was a young man of about 25 years of age, but there was uh, three other young men or uh, about 18 years of age went into the woods as well. And they noticed uh, the meditator sitting there, but they hadn't really seen a person sit still like that before and not move. And uh, they came back about 10 minutes later, the person hadn't moved, their eyes closed. And then they went further around in the woods exploring and came back about half an hour later. Again, the person hadn't moved. Then they came back even later, about an hour later, still there was no movement. At this point, what they decided they would do is they would take some sticks and branches and uh, they were looking down from a high bank towards the uh, meditator by the stream and there was a high bank. And they were hitting trees up on the top of the bank with branches to make various sounds. And so they did that for several minutes and the meditator never moved again. But finally, the meditator opened their eyes and the boy, young men are cheered. And the three of them looked into the eyes of the person meditating for about half a minute, silence. And then one of the young men, one of the three said in very respectful tones, may I ask you, what are you doing? And the, and the Rosicrucian meditating said one word, 
which resounded up the bank. Meditation. And then they looked at each other for about a minute. And then two of the three young men left. But the third stayed and looked longer. So each of us have different reasons for going into the deep woods and having an encounter with the deep current of spirituality and the Rosicrucians. And then that day, particularly the third one who stayed longer, was given an important key of meditation. In this way, to us learn more about meditation and may realize the importance of doing it on a daily basis. But our reality has to change to see how important it is. Another story I'll mention briefly to you. So the second, the second meditation teacher, uh, uh, years ago, when he was a young man, he grew up in Ireland, but later became part of the British colonial service. He joined that in 1954. And he had various duties as a protocol officer. And one day he had to deliver a photograph of the governor uh, to a, uh, a pure life society in, uh, on the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur. And uh, the head of that pure life society was a Hindu monk. And the uh, person whose name was John he thought it'd be you know, a simple task to do that and actually could maybe have the rest of the day off. But often though, our, our rendezvous with destinies don't occur that way. When he got there, he got talking to the person who needed to deliver the uh, photograph to. And they started to talk about meditation. And John stayed for the rest of the day and he learned the technique of meditation. John was a very learned person, but he didn't never heard about the technique of meditation. He heard about meditating, but not the technique. And he came back repeatedly. Later in life, John became a Benedictine monk. And Benedictines have a very balanced life. And he, part of what he did was he was a headmaster of a school. This was back in the West. One day, a young man came to him that had been to an ashram in California. And he asked him about, you know, I'd really like to know, learn about spirituality and how you meditate in the Christian tradition. Now, the Rosicrucian order is not a uh, religion, but we can learn things from, from uh, spiritual traditions of the world. And if you have a chosen religion, you'll find, I think, the Rosicrucian teachings will make them, uh, the chosen religion much more understandable, much more inspiring. But when this, this young man came to John, he was later years a headmaster uh, in the 1960s. Um, he said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna give you Augustine Baker's Holy Wisdom book. It's written in the 17th century. This is an important book to the Benedictine spirituality. And he thought that would sort of settle the matter for the young, this young man who came to him. But he was surprised uh, Soon afterwards, the young man came back really enthused. He said, wow, this is fantastic. And from that, John realized, you know, I think I, I, think I gotta go back and read that text by uh, uh, Augustine Baker more. About, and from that, it led him to the cloud of unknowing, one of the great uh, Western spirit classics of spirituality. And from that, it led John to the uh, John Cassian's conferences, another, uh, classic of Western spirituality. And John Cassian is a rather remarkable figure because he, he, he bridges in some ways both the Eastern and Western church. And he, his conferences is based on conversations that he and Germanus, a companion had with the, uh, when he was in the Egyptian desert. And there's a tradition there in early Christianity, the, the, the desert mothers and the desert fathers and their conversations there. What's quite remarkable about this is that often we take for granted knowing the technique of meditation. It's only in relatively recent years that the technique of the meditation was that, that known, particularly in the West. 
because you can search back through various Western spirituality texts. They will not tell you the technique of meditation. Generally, that'd be passed orally. Or it may be told to you if you know the technique already, and then you can see, aha, that's what they're saying in a semi-veiled way. But one thing that's quite remarkable is John Cassian in his conferences, particularly in the conference 10, does give the method. And from that, John was able to use that to bring the method of, of meditation back into Benedictine practice and back into Christianity more largely. Speaking about John Main. Um, and it's interesting that John Cassian um, was before the days of psychologists, but psychologists, psychology you know, has its root in psyche to mean mind and soul. And profoundly, it's the study of the soul. And many of these early uh, desert fathers and desert mothers, they are in their own way were, were uh, highly insightful forerunners of psychologists because when they're teaching their students and observing their own actions, they're very insightful about, uh, about meditation. So you see, not everybody's doing meditation because one, they don't necessarily know the technique. They don't necessarily know the value. And that takes time and growing and maturing over time for what's right for each person. Another question I want to answer for you is, is meditation an end in itself? And the short answer to that is no. You know, its purpose is uh, for self-mastery and greater service. You know, part of its purpose is for health, the greater wholeness. Helps us fulfill our mission in life. Now, I know often one may experience that when you're meditating, you don't want to come out of meditation sometimes. I know sometimes we feel, we feel a lot of distractions and maybe frustration, but just keep coming back to the breath. I think you'll find that you've had a very deep experience of meditation, even if you feel outwardly there's been a lot of distraction. But even when you go, one goes deeply into meditation and really enjoy it, don't want to come out. It's good, to, it's good yes, to be spending. If you can spend an hour or two in meditation each day, that's great. You'll think you'll find if you meditate an hour each day that you can have an hour less of sleep as long as you're getting a re reasonable amount of sleep other, otherwise. And meditation can be used to catch up in your sleep. Um, but an important part, part of this is that the meditation is allowing us um, to be of greater service to others and fulfill our, our mission in life. That in itself will actually deepen our meditation. Now you can also ask, does meditation help with not procrastinating? Because superficially one could say, well, you know, there's a person meditating. They, they, don't, they don't seem to be uh, doing what they're supposed to with terms of their actions and discharging their duties in life. But quite the contrary, meditation will help us with not procrastinating. Even if you try to use it to procrastinate, you'll find that it'll tend to intensify what you need to do. Uh, not only sometimes when you're getting distracted in meditation, but also afterwards. Because in psychology it's been studied that mindfulness meditation, but other methods of meditation, they do help us. It's actually an act of non-avoidance. It actually helps us get focused, activated and directed. It leads to that intensification of the alpha waves in the brain, which actually help coordinate and unify the different regions of the brain that then allow us to focus and think and use our full resources, both inwardly and through the master within and the subconscious, but also in the brain to do things, things that seem daunting or things that we need in our conscious to do will be more activated to do and there'll be less procrastination. You could also ask, you know, how can I build the practice of meditation into my busy work and family life? Well, as I mentioned earlier, one hour of meditation can mean one hour less of sleep, but still maintain your needed sleep. And I know it can vary. Some people need eight hours of sleep, some need seven, some need 10. Each person will come with a decision what they need based on that. But you can still have that benefit for meditation. If you need 10 hours, one hour of meditation, nine hours of sleep, I think you'll find fine. Also, meditation will help us to work more accurately and decide what needs to be done and in what order and what not to do. In fact, it'll help us with saying yes when we particularly need to say yes and no when we need to say no. 
in terms of requests or our relationships, and that will save us a great deal of time in our life. Also, we can do chores mindfully. Meditation can continue ceaselessly, like John Cassian's Conference 10 talks about the ceaseless, ceaseless prayer, ceaseless interior prayer, which is meditation. You can keep do the meditation all the time. Now you could say, well, I've got to just focus on doing this particular math problem or this particular answer. Yes, keep coming back to the meditation, but the deeper part of ourself can continue, especially when we guided with the breath. Even with the eyes open, that deeper breath will continue us to attune with the cosmic and have meditate. You can also ask, you know, does meditation transform both the mind and the body? The answer is yes. In fact, it'll transform not even in a long-term way as well. For example, it's been demonstrated that it increases brain volume. As I mentioned, the alpha waves will be more active. The two nervous systems, sympathetic, parasympathetic, They'll work harmlessly, harmoniously together as measured by heart rate variability. The immune system is boosted. Mood is elevated. There's all these things that are causing long-term transformation of the mind and the body. And yes, you know, it's, it's calming. It'll help us concentrate and use all our resources to reframe and resolve issues. Often what we find we're stressed about um, and we're not taking the mature view of or interpretation of meditation will assist us in. In fact, if you've got any challenging thing to do, meditate before it. I think you'll find it becomes done more efficiently, more accurately, less needs to be redone, and more of the right decisions uh, are made. It transforms our life, our mind, and our body. Meditation is both uh, preservative and generative. In fact, neurogenerative for the uh, neurons in the brain. And we're healthy, our capacity to deal with challenging situations is increased and we're strengthening our capacity to support others. And you can be inspiring examples to others to transform their, their minds and their bodies. Also can be asked, will meditation help improve my relationship with myself and others? Short answer is yes. In meditation, we practice self-acceptance. This is one of the things that's been measured by some of the psychologists I work with, meditation. We affirm our body, mind, and whole being. Coupled with the relaxation, this allows us to realize how capable we are. And we are strengthened in, in entering into situations calmly. And when we're calm, we can concentrate better, be more accurate. And one of the psychologists I work with who studies meditation, he refers to meditation as a form of quiet courage. Now, often we think about courage as on special circumstances in our life. But meditation allows us to have that daily quiet courage. To continually do on what, whatever we have to do daily. Whatever you have to face after this work and worship, this hour together. And embrace the great life-giving lessons, the life-affirming lessons that are in these matters. Part of the value of meditation too, it allows us to go beyond ourself. Now one may think, well, I want to always be with myself, but keep in mind, you know, the, the analogy that Dr. A. Spencer Lewis talks about when uh, past imperative order that, you know, when we drink from life and we're not so pleased with it, was it because the cup we drank from our cup was soiled or was it because what we drank was soiled? Part of the value of meditation is we can get beyond ourselves and look at ourselves somewhat more objectively and see is our cup needed to be cleaning up, cleaned up so that when people do pure and wonderful things for us, we don't misinterpret them otherwise. This is a great boon in relationships. Also allows us to be discerning when we've been, when the, what we've received is not the purest and have and protect ourselves accordingly. And when we improve our relationship with ourselves, lo and behold, our relationship with everything else and others improves as well. As I said earlier too, we know when to say yes in relationships and no. And we were alerted more to telltale signs in relationships and how to proceed or not. You see, meditation calms the mind. You know when a pebble goes into a calm surface in the pond, you know that. But if our outer mind is agitated, someone can say something or do something like throwing a, a pebble or even a larger rock in the pond. We won't notice because 
because we've got so much agitation. We have turmoil within ourselves. We'll have turmoil in our relationships and our lives, even if we project or put that on others. You know, the, uh, the calmness and the patience and the sincerity and compassion and constructive and mature perspective are all boosted by meditation. And all these qualities are appreciated in important relationship with others, not only by ourselves, all who we come in contact with. You know, sometimes it's asked, in medit in other, are other practices such as visualization done as part of meditation session, will they be even more effect effective? The answer is yes. Just like when we took time to rate, do the work of the Council of Solace, we radiated love and well-being because we had ascended to the heights of the celestial sanctum. We were all the more ready to radiate that love and well-being compared to then if we had just turned our eye, closed our eyes and started doing it. As we same with visualization, when we're creating things in our minds, these various practices of the order that are le learned in a very graded systematic way. When we move to the heights of the celestial sanctum to visualize, we're all the more closer to working with the cosmic mind in view of that creation. So yes, it will help with all these things, as well as having that calmness, relaxation, and capacity to concentrate when we do these exercises. It can also be asked as my final question, and this is an unusual one that's submitted. Will meditation help heal the deepest wounds of the heart? Now it's quite poignant that the person put in the word deepest. And now we can interpret heart in multiple senses, just like in a sacred text. You know, there's a physical sense, there's a moral sense, there's a psychic sense, there's an intellectual sense, there's an overarching mystical spiritual sense. And this question has that. You know, heart health is greatly assisted by meditation through the relaxation and calmness I mentioned. Those deeper breaths assist, for example, with more fresh air and oxygen and the cosmic essence, the vital life force coming in. That in itself, to speak in alchemical terms, transmutes the body. But psychological, speaking, you know, being, being hurt, sometimes we'll say being wounded in the heart to different degrees and intensities. Healing can take place by seeing a new perspective, a broader and deeper viewpoint. You know, compassion for others prepares the heart to increase its capacity to radiate love and well-being. Meditation also assists us in facing ourselves and what habits, what the Rosicrucians refer to as laws in the subconscious, we need to change. Now I know often if one feels deeply hurt in one's life, feel like to the outer self, it can feel impossible to change. But through practice like the meditation and coming into the attunement with the master within, to know no disease, to know only peace, and deep harmony, let that flood in you'll find that the hurt was actually finite in its nature. And then you move to these infinite resources, they'll more than care for this. I know it's a gradual process. It's a lot of polishing on that soul personality that's within us to reflect be that living radiant embodiment of these. But from the perspective of incarnations, if you hold the doctrine of incarnation, we think of ourselves as beings over millennia. These periods of adjustments are relatively short and we have all the strength for them. And the greater the hurt or challenge, the greater will be the refinement and the rejuvenation and the strength. Uh, and just like we saw with aspiration by Leopold de Vascales, the greater the radiance from us. And the inspiring example will be for others and our capacity to assist others who have similar experiences. Once that's been done and faced and those laws of subconscious change, then the wounded heart will be ready to be transformed and transmuted in experiences of illumination and mystical union brought on by meditation and the other many exercises that are taught by the systematic teachings of the Rosicrucians and mystics. So let me in concluding say, we've covered some common and not so common questions about meditation. But we'll keep in mind that meditation makes for the most direct and sure wise counsel in our daily lives and increases our well-being and capacity for service. It is the central practice for the mastery of life and the fulfilling our mission in life. Thank you.